The last thing that we need to talk about is um, assessing risk in bonds. So first let's talk about price risk. Let's compare a short-term one-year bond and a long-term 10-year bond and try to figure out which one has more risk. So if we look at different yields um, for the two bonds and how the price changes, that will give us an indication of price risk. So remember, price risk is the concern that a rising yield will cause the, bond, the value of the bond to fall because remember we said interest rates go up, bond prices go down. So look at the impact of changes in the yield on the one-year bond versus a 10-year bond. The changes are in double-digit numbers for the 10-year bond, that long-term bond, versus the one-year bond. So the 10-year bond then has more price risk. It's more sensitive to interest rate changes. So now if we look at this in a chart, we can see that the curve, the price curve for the 10-year bond is much steeper than the one-year bond. So again, that also indicates a higher level of price risk. Another type of risk associated with bonds is reinvestment risk. And we alluded to this a little bit when we were talking about callable bonds and why someone might be disappointed to have a bond called because interest rates drop. So reinvestment risk is the concern that when those interest rates drop and your cash flows have to be reinvested at lower rates, you're going to make less money. <coughs> Excuse me. So for example, suppose you just won the lottery and you want to invest that money and live off the interest. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you, could in, you could invest in 10-year bonds or a series of 10 one-year bonds. If you pick the one-year bond strategy, that series of 10 one-year bonds, after year one, you're going to get $50,000, but you have to reinvest that principle. And so if interest rates fall, your annual income is going to fall. So for example, if they fall from 10% to 3%, your income is going to fall from $50,000 to $15,000. However, if you invest in the long-term 10-year bonds, you're locking in that 10% interest rate over a longer period of time and saving yourself from having that reinvestment rate risk or reinvestment risk. But again, this is going to assume that those bonds aren't callable. So if we compare price risk and reinvestment risk, price risk is low on a short-term bond, um, but high on a long-term bond. And then the reverse is true for reinvestment risk. So reinvestment risk is high for a short-term bond, but low for a long-term bond. So either way, you know, you, it's a trade-off. Short-term bonds are going to have high reinvestment risk. Long-term bonds are going to have high price risk. You're not going to find, um, in comparing these two risks, a bond that's going to have a low risk in both cases. Now up to this point, we've been talking about um, bonds with annual coupons. Now if we have semi-annual bonds, which is typically the case, we're just going to have to adjust our inputs. So we're going to multiply the number of years times 2 to get the number of periods, and then we're going to divide the interest rate by 2 to get a periodic rate. And then finally, we're going to divide the payment by 2 to, to get that periodic payment. So here's an example. If we've got a 10-year, 10% semi-annual coupon bond with a yield of 13%, um, what's the price? Now again, we're going to assume a $1,000 face value if it isn't already stated. So N is going to be 10 times 2 or 20. The interest rate is going to be 13 divided by 2 for 6.5. The payment is going to be 100 divided by 2 for 50. And the future value will be 1,000. We compute present value and we get 834.72. Again, we knew that this was going to be a discount bond because the interest rates have gone up from 10 to 13. So the price has to go down. So now, would you prefer a 10-year 10% bond or a 10-year annual bond or a 10-year semi, 10% semi-annual bond? So you're getting interest twice a year. 
Well, you want interest as often as possible. So the effective annual rate on that semi-annual bond is 10.25%. And so that's higher than 10%, so that's the one that you want. So let's take a look at that, um, that semi-annual bond with the 10.25% effective rate. If the proper price for that bond is $1,000, what would be the proper price for the annual coupon bond? Well, the semi-annual bond has a 10.25% effective rate, so that's what we're going to use for the yield. And then um, now we can just solve for the present value, and that would give us the price. So what we're saying is that the annual bond should earn the same EAR as the semi-annual bond, and that was 10.25%. So we had to throw EAR at you one more time. Now let's take a look at a 10% 10-year 10-year 10% semi-annual coupon bond selling at 1135.90 so that means it's selling at a premium callable in 4 years so here's our first callable bond and when it gets called it's the issuer is going to have to pay 1050 so what's the yield to call all we do here is we change our time our in to the time until it's called so that's four years from now, but with semi-annual payments, we're going to take four times two, so N will be eight. And then um, it's a 10% bond, so 1,000 times 10% is 100 divided by two is equal to 50. We have the price as 1135.90, sorry, didn't mean to skip over that. And then the face value will be the call premium of $1,050. Compute the interest rate and that gives us the 3.568%. But be careful, that's the periodic interest rate. So that's the semi-annual rate because it's a semi-annual bond. So we'll need to take that 3.568 and multiply it by 2. If we wanted an effective yield to call, then we could just solve for the effective rate and get 7.26. So if you bought these callable bonds, would you be more likely to earn the yield to maturity or the yield to call? You know, in this class, we're just going to take it that anytime the interest rates drop and bond prices go up, so the bond is selling at a premium, it's going to get called and we're going to get the yield to call. So um, when the coupon rate is 10% and the yield to call is 7.137, the firm could raise money by selling new bonds at 7.137 and um, could replace those old bonds where, where they had a 10% coupon rate. So again, it's selling at a premium, interest rates have dropped, it's safe to assume that it's going to get called and you're going to earn the yield to call instead of the yield to maturity. So when's a call more likely to occur? In general, if it sells at a premium, um, so the coupon rate is greater than the yield, a call is going to be likely. So we're going to expect to earn the yield to call on premium bonds and the yield to maturity on discount bonds. Um, back to risks. Default risk. That one makes sense. So that's just the possibility or the likelihood that the issuer is going to default on their interest or principal payments. And so what we use to measure the likelihood of default risk are bond ratings. And we'll talk about those in just a second. Um, real quickly, other types of bonds, mortgage bonds, debentures, subordinated debentures, investment grade bonds, junk bonds. You can read about this and you should have a general idea of um, what these are. And so some are based on um, the pecking order in terms of who gets paid first in liquidation or um, how the bond is secured in the case of a mortgage bond um, or the credit quality of the issuer in the case of investment grade and junk bonds. So here's what we mean by credit quality. We have a couple, there's actually a third one, um, main bond rating agencies. And so they will rate bonds in typically two major classes, investment grade and junk. The 
lower the credit quality. So A, AAA is the highest, C is the lowest. Um, there might be some actually lower than C, but the lower the credit quality, the higher the interest rate those issuers would have to pay. So what affects default risk in bond ratings? Um, their financial performance based on the ratios that we've seen already. Other qualitative factors, if there are other bonds that are more senior to this bond, if this bond is secured or not, um, if there are any guarantees about repayment like the sinking fund we talked about earlier. Other things, um, earning stability, what's going on in the regulatory environment, what's going on um, just in that firm's political arena. Um, do they have any other, do they have labor problems, do they have any outstanding liabilities that might keep them from covering their payments. Um, and then some other kind of worst case scenarios are bankruptcy. You need to just know that Chapter 11 and Chapter 7 exist. Chapter 11 says, hey, we think we can work this out. Let's just restructure our debt. Chapter 7, we're done. So in Chapter 11, the firm gets some protection from its creditors while they're trying to work things out. But if they can't work it out and um, they can't show that they're, they're viable potentially, then they'll flip to a Chapter 7. And so in Chapter 7, the liquidation, there's that pecking order I mentioned in terms of who gets paid first. So that's important for you to have a general idea of that order. And then lastly, um, in the reorganization versus a, a, a liquidation, it, the creditors play a huge part in how all this works and they have to agree to it. So this is kind of a negotiated process. So again, um, don't worry about too many of the details, but just understanding the big picture of how this works.